Thank you everyone for joining us uh, this evening or this morning, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Jenny Hornick and I'm the Digital Marketing Coordinator here at JMIR Publications. I'm very excited to be welcoming you all to our fifth webinar in coordination with the Society of Digital Psychiatry and JMIR Mental Health. So today's webinar topic, as you all know, is exploring smartphone apps as innovative tools for psychological treatment. So I'm going to go ahead and pass things on to the panel in just a moment, but a couple of things to note uh, prior. Firstly, as I just mentioned, all of the microphones are muted for the webinar, but we do encourage you to ask questions. So should you have any, um, you can drop those in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of the screen. And aside from that, we also want to let everyone know that we are recording the session and it will be available afterwards on YouTube and we'll also be sending out the recording um, over email to all registrants. So that is all from me. I'm going to go ahead and pass things over to Dr. John Torres. So Dr. Torres is the Director of Digital Psychiatry Division in the Department of Psychiatry at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, an affiliated hospital of Harvard Medical School. He's also the editor-in-chief of JMIR Mental Health. So without further ado, I will go ahead and pass things over to you, John. Thank you. And today we have a very special guest, Dr. Imogen Bell. You may have read, or you likely have read, many of her papers. And she is a NHMRC Early Leadership Fellow and a psychologist based at Origin and the Center for Youth Mental Health at the University of Melbourne in Australia. So I'm calling at 7 o'clock Boston time and it's sometime early in the morning for her. So Dr. Bell oversees a program of research on the development, evaluation, and implementation of innovative new digital treatments for youth, mental health, and illness that leverage smartphone apps, AI, and virtual reality technologies. We'll focus a little bit more on her smartphone app research, but there's a lot to it. So she brings a translational and multidisciplinary approach to her work which prioritizes traditional research methods such as randomized trials alongside industry practices like human-centered software design, development, and even business strategies. And so, Dr. Bell, thank you for joining us. And what I really want to focus on today is there's so many questions, but a little bit about how you've taken some of these ideas and made them into programs that we'll talk about that are being implemented on a national level, which is perhaps everyone's dream listening to these to the webinars. So, Let's maybe just talk about some of the new health technology you've helped design. You already helped me realize it's pronounced mellow, not Milo, as I said. But <laughs> what is mellow? Yeah, thanks, John. It's so nice to be here. It's actually 9 a.m. in the morning, so it's quite an acceptable time okay. here in Melbourne. <laughs> not too bad. Um, so, yeah, I work at, at Origin um, Digital, which is the digital arm of um, Origin, the Centre for Youth Mental Health at University of Melbourne. So we do a lot of work in using digital technologies, different types of digital technologies to enhance um, youth mental health um, treatments. So Mello fits within a broader program of research that includes, you know, virtual reality, you know, on, online therapies, lots of different things. Um this mellow was born from really um, thinking about mental health treatment for youth from a trans diagnostic perspective. So, you know, we have lots of different mental health conditions that young people are, um, are struggling with. And when you look underneath the hood at what might be driving those conditions, there, there are sort of common mechanisms um, that seem to give rise to, to those problems. Um, one of the really big ones um, is called repetitive negative thinking. So this worry and rumination going over and over negative thoughts in your mind um, in a way that's hard to stop and control. We did a welcome trust funded um, active ingredients project. Some people might be familiar with that, that scheme that Welcome Trust are a large funder in the UK. They were interested in uncovering what, what some of the drivers were of effective psychological treatments. And we looked at repetitive negative thinking um, as one of those and, and found that this was, you know, an important component or, or target within treatment. The thing about a lot of these mechanisms is that they unfold in real real time they're problems in people's everyday lives which is one of the big promises of smartphone apps is that it bridges that gap between traditional 
therapeutic settings, like in a, you know, face-to-face session with, you know, everyday life where those problems tend to occur. When you're worrying and ruminating, it's a process that's unfolding in real time. So we were really interested in developing Mellow as a as a, a real-time um, intervention or, or what's known as a just-in-time adaptive intervention, which is about getting the right intervention at the right moment for the individual. So it's designed to disrupt repetitive negative thinking um, in the moment using um, real-time tailored interventions. And in terms of Mellow, clearly one, an app or a final product is the goal. How did, where did it begin? Was it an idea? Was it a sketch? Yes. Well, we'd like to think from a, um, so human centered design perspective, we like to think about problems first. So what, what are the problems that exist within that, that young, I'm interested in youth mental health. So what are the problems that young people have with their mental health? You're getting a really detailed understanding of what the experience of, of that problem is and, and also what the existing sort of solutions might be. So what are the treatments and um, solutions to those problems that are available and what are the gaps in, in those um, that might be able to be addressed with with technology. So the big gap when it comes to Mellow is recognition through really through clinic clinical work actually as a psychologist and um, the director of Origin Digital, Mario Alvarez, um, is a clinical psychologist. And it was one of his really early ideas actually is that um, particularly worry and rumination, repetitive negative thinking is something that happens it's a process that unfolds and so the solution that that particular problem um, is very prevalent it's it's one of the biggest targets of treatment the psychologists out there would be familiar with how common it is for people presenting in the clinical room to have issues getting stuck in their negative thoughts Um, but that you can teach people skills and strategies there's effective intervention strategies that work for um, for this problem, but they're not delivered at the right time um, in people's daily life. So it was that intricate recognition of that particular problem and knowledge of the technology solutions and the capabilities of smartphone apps in particular that led to the idea. That makes sense. And related to it, did you make the app and kind of iterate? Did you have a prototype? Or for people listening who want to build something, what was the, the short version of how you built it? Yes. Yeah. It, it's interesting because one of the big challenges I think that we face in, in research land is that we um, we don't necessarily have funding for development um, and industry has the opposite sort of problem. They have quite a lot of funding for development, but they don't necessarily con- um, consider research as a foundation. And so a lot of the products that are being built don't have that strong scientific evidence or thinking behind them. So they don't tend to work. So there's this mismatch, isn't there, that we're, um, we see yeah. a lot of discussion of in the academic literature. We were lucky enough to get funded from a philanthropic funder called Telstra Foundation, um, which funded us to do the development work um, so I, I over saw a team of a mobile app developer, UX designer, a UI um, designer and a, and a branding designer um, and a content um, expert as well. So we worked as a team to um, develop Mellow and there, there was a lot of workshops within a program called Miro, actually, which is great for running online workshops. Um, but really, I followed the lead of of the, my role within that was the, you know, the scientist, the clinician, how to make something effective and the understanding of what works. And their role was to use their technology expertise and their product development expertise to translate that into um, something really engaging and compelling for the end user. So definitely a multidisciplinary team is what I'm hearing. And again, you did a lot of focus groups and work with people that experience we know, and you've published those to really make sure that came into it. And yes, absolutely. Again, With the Mellow app, I think, can people see it or download it or? Yes. Um, So this is, this is one of the other things that's quite unique because I'm sure many people have found that, you know, when they read an academic article on an, on an app, they'll, they'll, you know, get excited by the results. Maybe they want to check it out and you can't actually download it. Likewise, you might be able to search lots of apps on the app store and then you want to find the evidence and you can't. So again, it's that mismatch um, that we're all too aware of. Um, Mellow is a good example of um, a solution to that. So we have actually released the app. Um, after we published the, the randomized control trial results in JMIR last last December. So you can read that the results of that RCT, really promising, um, you know, early findings showing that even using Mellow for six weeks 
um, in a self-guided way, so no clinician there, saw um, really significant improvements in um, depression, anxiety, and repetitive negative thinking relative to the control group. So we had effect sizes, moderate to large effect sizes, and we had sustained engagement um, uh, in 60% of the sample all the way through. Um, so really that's an exciting result and quite different to what we typically see in self-guided apps. Um, and yes, it is available to download, but it's only available to download in Australia at the moment. Okay. Still 60% engagement for those of you who don't know, sometimes it's like 5% is the average. So that may be a 12x improvement for, for these apps. And you, you did the study and I think we'll talk about the journey, but clearly that's one part. And now you're doing a lot of implementation research kind of next mm. part in it. If you had to give people an overview of kind of what is the scale of the implementation research and what have you learned so far? I realize it's it's ongoing. Yes. Um, so we really entered the implementation phase, I would say, um, earlier this year. So, I mean, Im implementation, it's interesting because I'm approaching this more and more from a bit of a business sort of strategy perspective because, you know, we might in academia think about implementation as running an implementation trial and things like this, but really implementation is getting things, these, these interventions into the hands of people that they were designed to help, right? Um, and, you know, the context of implementation when it comes to Mellow is because it's a self-guided app. It's not designed to be integrated within services, you know, specifically, although I expect a lot of clinicians will start to use it in their care. Um, is So it's not a complicated, you know, clinic environment that we need to embed it into. So that's where implementation science and that thinking can become really useful. But we have to think about this from a perspective of, again, a multidisciplinary perspective. I work a lot with communications managers thinking about, you know, how to actually create messages to people through the right channels that mean that they understand Mellow, they know where to get it, um, and that they're, it's basically awareness building um, is what we're doing at this particular point in time. And, and then, you know, making sure that behind that, the app is properly sustained so that the infrastructure is there to make sure that, um, you know, it supports people to use it. And once you've got thousands and thousands of people using it, which we do now after only a month, a month um, following our launch campaign, um, you know, that requires a different sort of infrastructure that researchers are typically used to. Yeah. So it sounds like it's taking different parts from different expertise and specialties to make this work. And again, for I think a lot of the audience listening is wanting to publish papers or do research or build up the validity of their process. And you've kind of alluded to, you had some feasibility work, you had some community work, you had some pilot work, you had RCTs implementation. How did you find ways to kind of publish or kind of show the world what you're doing in an academic way? Because the research sounds like it keeps evolving and changing. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, that that's kind of more fam familiar to me as a, as a researcher, you know, like I, it, through the process of designing and, and developing and doing all this work, you're obviously constantly reading um, these academic articles because you're trying to understand, you know, this idea of just-in-time adaptive interventions or JITIs, for example, that's a relatively yeah. new type of smartphone technology that's kind of come out over the last few years. And I only, I would have only been aware of that by keeping up to date with the literature. So by doing that reading, you become aware of the types of articles that are being, um, you know, the type of research studies that you can conduct and the type of publications that might come out of that. Um, so, so most of the publications that I'd read in that area would come from JMIR. Um, yeah. But I, you know, there's other journals too. I don't think that there's really any that are in that as, as big in the, in the digital health space. Um, so that's how I kind of go about, about, doing that but there's a lot of interesting like kind of newer publications that I'm seeing which are making use of the data being collected from apps um, you know in an ethical way um, that really helps us to understand more about how these apps work understanding and tackling issues like engagement um, when you have a you know digital intervention that's scaled with such a large amount of users there's a real opportunity to um to you know uh, uncover um you know insights that we haven't traditionally been able to do with the numbers that we um that we have in traditional kind of um publications rcts and whatnot so i when i look towards the future i'm really interested in publishing some of those now that mellow is out 
Um, but certainly, you know, bread and butter in the digital health space would be, you know, development paper, um, uh, looking at the co-design process, um, and then, um, and then typically there's a there's a clinical trial, usually an early feasibility trial, and then a, and then a larger trial, and then implementation, and it kind of flows on from that. So that's the pipeline I'm in at the moment. No, that makes sense, and it's it's a long pipeline. Certainly, I think in some ways we think technology is fast, and it is it's faster than drug studies, but there's a lot to do. In, yeah, so in it takes it. time to build effective, you know, good interventions. It really does. Yeah, and I think we've written about this before. I think sometimes when things are done quickly, it's nice that they're done quickly, but then they don't seem to have the lasting impact in the community. In some ways, I think the burden of digital is it really has to work at scale. So if you're kind of just, yes. if you're creating a drug, most of us have similar biology, you know when the body is going to work. If you're creating a digital intervention, you have to think of it working for a lot of different people at a lot of different times over. And so it may actually be harder in, in some ways, but Related image into what we're talking about, different types of publishing. I think writing papers is never exactly easy. And what are some of your tips for getting stuff written and, and published at, as you just see broadly? Yeah. Um, so I usually think at the very, very beginning um, what the journal is that I want to um, be, be targeting. So I do publish a fair bit in JMIR because that's the the journal that has the um, is the is the best for digital health, basically, and digital mental health. Um, so I usually go ahead and create a, um, a template that's in the template of the journal. I believe in JMI, you can actually download like a word template that has like instructions for each of the yes. sections, which is really <laughs> helpful. Um, so it'll even have like comments from saying, you know, make sure that this is in this section, this is in that section that saves a lot of time because anyone who's published before would be aware of how much time goes into actually just formatting your, your article in the right, your manuscript in the right format at the beginning. So that's something that I do. I make sure that the formatting is all right. And I put comments to myself like, um, you know, 5,000 word max or, you know, the abstract needs to be 200 words, things like that. So I'm guided by that template as I write. Um, that means I don't have to be thinking about those administrative little tasks whilst I'm writing. I can just kind of get going. The other thing I like to do is find a model, model paper um, from the journal, ideally, ideally several model papers. Um, what I mean by model paper is a publication that's similar to what I've done. Um, so with Mello, the randomized controlled trial, finding a randomized controlled trial um, that is that of a smartphone-based intervention um, that I think is really well written and well designed. Like each of all the all the bits and pieces that I expect to be there are there. I get multiple versions of that to cross-reference and see which ones because some papers have different strengths and weaknesses. So getting a around sense and then I use that I constantly refer back to those papers and see how they've structured things um, that helps to speed up the process as well um, I like to write my introductions and discussions just um, all at once just getting everything out on um, on the page I put the reference the citations in little comments as I kind of go along um, those would be my main tips yeah those are are useful tips and I think one thing I've noticed too is that we certainly have no word limit, but often most kind of successful mm. papers may be between 2,000 to 4,000 words. I think mm -hmm. some, you probably, if you go above 4,000 words, you can if there's good reason, but you probably don't need to, or maybe you you could find ways to condense it or keep it, keep it simpler in, in some ways, because also it's taxing on reviewers and then yeah. If it's too long, then readers may not make it through too. Because in some ways you are trying to inspire readers to agree with you, to see your science, to do it. So it's you you it may be easy to cut some off the top too in, in doing it. Yes, and then I definitely I think related imaging, as you alluded to, I think it's always fascinating for me to read papers. There's always a new thing I learned from each paper in this field. Like there, there's so many interesting nuggets, but Maybe you could share when you read papers, like what makes you go like, wow, that was like a really great paper or like that. And like, is, is there something that makes papers pop or it's just timing and luck? Oh, gosh. I mean, when there's one is topic related, like so if it's something that's just new and different um, and it really advances thinking, it's not just kind of 
template. I know that tem- I said before model papers are great and templates yeah. <laughs> are great and stuff like that, but um, it's not just template. You can use that, that, you know, model papers and template papers to get the structure of things. But what you really need to be doing is saying something different, you know, adva- advancing things and setting up a justification that excites people. So, um, and ne- don't forget about the problem statement, you know, the very beginning of the paragraph, um, of the introduction session section, you're really talking about what the problems are that you're tackling. I, I guess in, you know, I write the same sort of thing each time because it's always youth mental health, but other people that are reading that might not. So really recognizing that you're that the magnitude of the problem and the seriousness of what it is that you're um of what it is that you're writing about captures attention and when there's novelty in the topic that's there. Secondly, I would say just how easy it is to read, like a really nice paper that flows logically, you know, everything is um, being really thought about in terms of what information comes where and in what sequence. I always like kind of um, repetition across each section in terms of, you know, the research questions or the aims. It should be really logical how the method set up. The results section should follow the same sort of process in answering those questions. Then the discussion interprets them. So that kind of repetition helps the brain when the readers, um, you know, make sense of it and follow along. That's always a pleasure reading those papers. Yeah, that makes sense. And I'll also say some papers that at least excite me are, we don't get that many negative result papers. And I realize people Mm. don't love to publish them, but sometimes there's so much to learn from where digital health didn't go right. And we know it doesn't always go right. It was perfect. I have a great example of that, that I'm going to be submitting to JMR soon in virtual (laughs) reality. Actually, it's it's really interesting virtual reality paper. (laughs) I mean, so many things do go right. And I just remember a while ago, we published a paper that looked at engagement strategies and every paper said it was the most engaging app. And I was like, (laughs) but we know engagement is hard, but no one is saying it. So so I do think, again, if presented well as a learning opportunity, those can be very impactful papers. And I I think there was once a paper a while ago from someone in the UK, it was called the Non-Adoption and Sustainability, the NAAS framework, Non-Adoption and Sustainability. It just said like why things can go wrong. And it pointed out this is hard work. And like, this is research. We'll have some not successes and we'll move to successes. But I think those are certainly exciting. I think sometimes people go like, no one wants to read a negative result. You go like, I think they... That they may in part, especially if it says how you're going to build it and and make it done. But as you said too, like also letting the clinical relevance, because even if you let's say have an abstract mm. machine learning thing, as you said, like if it if you can explain why it's clinically relevant to people, it makes a difference. But if you assume your readers will like recognize the brilliance, yes. they may not. Yes. We hope yes. they will, but <laughs> yes. they may not. Yeah. I would add to that as well, like as a reviewer. Um, you know, I read these papers on code, you know, co-design sort of papers or feasibility papers, and they're often yeah. very focused on the app itself. Like we built this very specific app, but th- we don't do that just so that that particular app is, you know, whatever, or even in the RCT, like now we know that Mellow is effective. It's like, well, Mellow is a just-in-time, you know, think about the model and what it is that is contributing to the literature that now this model of intervention um hopefully will give rise to other examples of it. So I always encourage when I'm peer reviewing people yeah. to think beyond just the individual instance. I think those make better papers. I It makes sense. Yeah. Because again, hopefully lots of people use Mellow or other apps that you guys are all thinking of, but you want people to read and say, Hey, I could apply that. And Mellow is exactly. a just in time adaptive intervention. And it's funny, someone once told me that stands for JEDI, Just-In-Time Adaptive Intervention. I don't know, because I never get to talk to people as much about it. I don't know if it's... <laughs> JEDI sounds a little bit Star Wars-like, so I'll just leave it at that. I know, I know. I think it is JEDI. <laughs> I, I'm still trying to get my head around this but it's so... <laughs> Maybe someone in the chat could tell us what it should be called, or we'll just rename yeah. it to something JEDI does better. sound cooler. It does sound cooler, <laughs> but almost too cool. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and I think... Again, I think everyone here listening probably has some very really exciting ideas they want to move forward. And I think, again, if people look at your research portfolio over time, you, you've you done that. You've moved it from ideas to working with people to building prototypes to testing it. How, do, how does one start to build that type of research career apart from like finding a wealthy donor who wants to support you. And that's one pathway, but like, what's a more realistic pathway that you've seen work? (laughs) Yes. Yes. Well, you know, we do always need funding. So um, that, 
that is an important part of that of that pathway um i think how would i answer this question i think that i approached this in my so i did my my phd in a um developing a an um blended approach to treating psychosis using um an app that i called um savvy that actually used an app called movie sends which is a ecological momentary assessment or experience sampling app that exists already so I, um, what I did is I took that app and I applied it to this intervention model uh, using this EMA within psychological treatment and then conducting an RCT to assess that. And what that enabled me to do is rather than building something completely new and getting the funding, like I've sort of done with Mellow, it, it allows you to kind of get the proof of concept. So does this idea have legs basically is what you, what you can do with those sorts of approach. So have a look at and, and see whether there's a possibility of doing that because not only does that, um, you know, give you some direction and understanding whether the early ideas that you have might be, you know, effective and worth pursuing, it also gives data that can then um, get you that further funding. That pilot data is really great. Then you have to get really good at grant writing um, or, or um, do what I did also was um, I wanted to, in my very early career post PhD, I wanted to, um, um, you know, do a postdoc with people that I really admired. Um, and I ended up, <laughs> ended up at Origin Digital, could have ended up elsewhere. Um, yeah. But I ended up at Origin Digital working with Mario and um, and and developing apps. So that institute had the infrastructure that enabled me to to develop something new and those funding relationships. So thinking about that, you know, who you work with, um, depending on what it is that you're interested in doing. And there's lots of different places that will take you down different paths and eventually you have to make choices. Um, yeah. And from there, I've just invested a lot in, in thinking from an industry perspective as well as an academic perspective and, and investing in that training and, and that team. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely paying off. And I think it's useful to have your experience of doing it. I think both of us, I think, also share admiration for Mario, who who runs Origin Digital. He's done a very good job in kind of leading the space and creating very impressive work o over a long time. But maybe with that, we'll transition to some questions. We'll try to get to as many as possible. Maybe this first one will be, what do you think are the best references for benchmarking retention kind of an engagement oh, as a field gosh. we've not done a great job of defining yeah. engagement even though we say it's important so how I know how how do we do this or should we do this gosh <laughs> I mean everybody knows how difficult this question is and that there is no answer to it I, I'm not an engagement expert um yeah. so I've certainly tried to tackle this question with engagement experts before when it comes to benchmarking our own studies. Um, and I think sometimes that is what you have to do. You know, you have to look at the individual. One of the difficulties is that we're all trying as a field to define what good engagement is. But when you start to think about this in detail, you realize that each intervention is different. Um, so, you know, an intervention that's designed to do, you know, digital intervention that's designed to have one module a week completed in a one hour sitting, that measure of engagement is very different to Mellow, which is designed to be, um, you know, used at any instance that you're worrying or ruminating. You know, I might be worrying and ruminating 50 times a day, another person's only struggling with that problem, you know, once a week. So should we hold those two people to the same standards? Um, also, I've been thinking a lot lately about, you know, maybe digital interventions, a drop off of an engagement could indicate that the intervention is working. If you're designing yeah. something that's only designed, that's only intended to be used when you're having a problem, then maybe as that problem goes away because of the intervention, you stop using it. So I don't think um, that engagement is linear. Um, and I think we don't really have a good enough understanding of it. And I think there's a lot of nuance at the intervention and the individual level that that gets in the way of answering that question. So think about it from the intervention um, specifically is my advice about that. That makes a lot of sense. It's hard. And I'm putting this paper in the chat for everyone. It says system usability scale benchmarking for digital health apps and meta-analysis and JMIR, mHealth and uHealth. The system usability scale is not perfect as many flaws, but it's interesting as this team tried to kind of take a mean of system usability scales. So at least it gives you a reference to compare to, but again, it doesn't mean mm. your app is going to be usable or better, but if you score like a two out of a hundred, maybe yes. 
you have we more used work that scale recently. Do. It is quite useful, yeah. Yeah, and it's usability as well, I think. Um, so yeah. not quite the same as engagement, but useful to have those benchmarks. We have to be careful with benchmarks, I don't think, John. I know. You know, yeah. how meaningful are they? W will they give a sense of certainty where, they're, where, they're sh where they can't be? And that's what I worry yeah. about with those things. No, I think exactly too. And it's not linear, as you said, different groups and populations have different needs. So as we search for this one metric, we do kind of lead ourselves down some tricky paths that we, we may not want to go down. And it's definitely a, a big issue in the field. This is a, an interesting question thing. What do you think are the major hurdles to kind of escalate or scale solutions to, say, low middle income countries in different places where the need could be even greater for digital yeah. solutions like you've developed? Mm. Yeah. So what are the major hur hurdles? Yeah, I've been thinking about this lately as it comes to Mellow, because obviously, um, you know, this is a self-guided intervention. It seems to be, it has signals for effectiveness. So who are the, and why couldn't we scale it to to other sorts of countries and what would that actually take? Um, and I suspect we might start to be, you know, we're actually we're already being contacted by collaborators that are interested in doing that work in, in Turkey and other places. Nice. So we've been thinking about this and the barriers are, first of all, language. Um, so as a developer, as an app developer, we need to have a team and resources that can actually, you know, translate that app. We need to create pipelines that will figure out who, you know, which versions of apps um, people get. But as we scale as well, we have more technical issues, which means we need a bigger team, which means it's more costly. You know, we haven't talked about sources of funding for something like Mellow, but certainly if we have, you know, a global free app, um, we're going to have to start to figure it. We can't rely on, you know, the generous donors forever. So that's one hurdle actually supporting the sustainability of that scaling. Um, and then when it comes to the individuals on the ground in those countries, there are, you know, tech technology issues. Um, we're seeing global rates of smartphone access and ownership, you know, increasing humongously. So I think we'll get to the point of, of ubiquity, but I think in Western countries, we often think we've already arrived when in fact we, we haven't. Um, yeah. So, you know, actually access to the technology is always going to be an issue in, in certain, um, in certain countries and even just things like what phones they have, um, you know, battery life, all, all sorts of things like that are going to end up being hurdles. Yeah. yeah, no, it's it's definitely daunting, but I think possible. In some ways, the barriers yes. may, may be less in certain countries to do it, because I think when you have so much regulation, it's hard to move forward, but you certainly need some protections. And that perhaps there's a couple of questions related to basically digital health privacy in general. And as way of background, in the US, in the last two weeks, the Federal Trade Commission, not FDA, kind of went after two digital health companies for kind of privacy violations that seem very egregious. And, and these weren't apps, these weren't research, these were kind of companies, but you just Google FTC, mental health or substance abuse, it's in the news. But how... Oh, wow. How did you guys, Imogen, clearly you're doing this in a research setting the right way, but how did you, what was the approach towards privacy and data security? Yes. Um, so we, within the context of Mellow, up until the point we scaled, you know, this was in a randomized controlled trial setting. So we had informed consent, you know, our research assistants sitting down, doing the informed consent. Um, the data was hosted on secure local servers um, as it continues to be. Um, so those protections were kind of, you know, bundled up within that. Now, when we've taken Mellow to scale, um, we do use the data from um, the, the users, um, but we have a terms of service document that clearly, which has been co-designed co with young people. So it's been, the wording has been reviewed because that's one of the things that is a problem with these companies is that they're not transparent and, and clear enough about how that data is being is being used. So, you know, it's not necessarily a problem that that, that data is being used for, for, for certain purposes so long as they're ethical and so long as there's informed consent and transparency and clarity about how that's being done. So with Mellow, people who um, sign up to the app are, are informed about how that data is being used and we don't sell the data to third parties. We use it entirely for um, research. It's completely de-identified. Um, and all of that information is available, um, you know, on the website via a click at the sign up page so that it's really easy for people to, um, to understand. Yeah. 
which is very impressive and sadly sometimes very rare in a lot of these apps. So it's at least I always tell people I work with, find an app that has really good privacy and security as the basis. And this would need yes. that with two check marks. And sadly, sometimes that's a very easy way to eliminate a lot of apps. So it's it's definitely a model that you've done and created. Maybe one last question that kind of does in the chat, if people want to work with Mellow or learn more about it, how can, do they email you to talk about future projects? Do they read the papers? Is there, what are the ways that people can learn more? Yeah, certainly send me um, an email. I believe that'll go out after the webinar or might even be within the, the details that have gone out already. Um, you know, you, you can Google me to find to find that. Google Mellow, you'll find the um, Mellow RCT paper on, on JMIR. I'm sure that will be disseminated as well. Have a read of that paper. It's, um, it's interesting. I, I think it's a good example. I'm biased because I wrote it, but I think it is a good example of like, a, um, yeah. you know, how to write those up. So you could, you know, think about using that as a bit of a model paper if you're writing articles like that. Um, Mellow also has a website um, that if you just Google Mellow, Mellow app, um, you should be able to find it. Um, I mean, yeah. I'll, I'll confirm it's a very nice paper to, to build off and to understand. So I think I want to, we'll stop here because we like to stop 20 minutes to the hour to keep these brief. I think people know how to contact Dr. Bell, how to contact me and JMIR and the Society of digital psychiatry. So thank you everyone for tuning in, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Till next time. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye.